James Edward Smith was a tarot card reader and voodoo priest who was convicted of the robbery homicide of Houston office insurance manager Larry Rojas in 1983. He is most well known for his bizarre last meal request, Rayakunda dirt, for a voodoo ritual. <laughs> yes, I am going to try this. Okay, earthy. He, of course, was denied this request, instead settled for a cup of yogurt. There are a lot of misconceptions about James and his story, so let's get to it. James Edward Smith was born on October 19th, 1952 in Jefferson, Kentucky. That's 69 years ago today. He was one of 12 children and his parents divorced when he was very young. His mother, Alexine Hamilton, was a school teacher from Indiana. Alexine said that James was a loving and kind child, but as he got older and his interest shifted from innocent things to the dark arts that he completely changed and became unruly. He began practicing black magic, witchcraft, and voodoo. Black magic has traditionally referred to the use of supernatural powers or magic for evil and selfish purposes. With respect to the left-hand path and right-hand path dichotomy, black magic is the malicious left-hand counterpart of the benevolent white magic. Voodooism is complicated. Firstly, there is the traditional voodoo religion that originates in Africa. Then there is a modern revival of voodooism in Louisiana. Neither of these have anything to do with the devil or black magic or sticking pens in voodoo dolls. That type of voodoo is faux voodoo. I guess you could call it that. It's associated more with the occult and black magic and has little to do with its African roots. Voodoo as a dark art used to curse people People, punish people or cause people pain is more of a trope that we see in movies. No, we're not crazy. No, we're not going in some backwoods sacrificing any babies or anything like that. No, we're not digging up any of your people's graves or any of that stuff. We are practicing a legitimate religion. Well, the thing about voodoo, that they, they can get a voodoo dog. I do it all here and just stick pins in it. In Hollywood, they do that. In the movies, they do that to make money off of it. But voodoo is a religion. Moving on to witchcraft, which is the practice of what the practitioner, or the witch, believes to be supernatural skills and abilities, like the casting of spells and the performance of magical rituals. Witchcraft is a broad term that varies culturally and societally, and can be difficult to define with precision. So if you weren't familiar before, you can now see how these three practices have the potential for a lot of overlap. The level of involvement that James had in black magic and witchcraft is unclear, but at the least, he was very curious. I've read that he left home when he was 17 and that he received some college. On the other hand, James himself said that he left home when he was 15 years old and traveled extensively throughout the world. Whether he left home at 15 or 17, what we do know is that in March of 1972, James joined the US Navy. What he did in the Navy is unclear, but what is clear is according to James, that he was given a dishonorable discharge on June 7th, 1975 for striking an officer. He was subsequently hospitalized for a psychiatric evaluation at the Great Lakes Naval Hospital. He was 23 years old. James eventually ended up in New Orleans. He started working in NOLA as a tarot card reader with a business involving voodoo. Haitian voodoo is the specific kind of voodoo that originates in Louisiana. It's sometimes called New Orleans voodoo, Louisiana voodoo, or Creole voodoo. Haitian voodoo came about through syncretism, which is the process of incorporating different influences to create something new. So Louisiana voodoo incorporates West African traditional religions and also Roman Catholic beliefs that were brought to Haiti by French colonists. From the 16th to the 19th century, when West Africans were trafficked in the Atlantic slave trade and transported to the Americas, they brought their traditions with them. So a combination of slaves and Haitian migrants who settled in Louisiana is how 
Louisiana voodoo was created. It pretty much died out in the early 1900s, but eventually made a comeback. Revivalists brought it back in the late 19th century, thus modern Louisiana voodoo. This, again, is different than the pop culture voodoo, if you will, that is associated with black magic, casting spells, charms, the occult, witchcraft, and so on. Louisiana voodooists believe in a supreme creator god named Bon Yi. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, so I apologize. They believe they can communicate with Bon Yi through Lowa, which are spirits. In Louisiana voodoo, there are 232 recorded names of Lowa, but practitioners believe that there are thousands that exist. To my understanding, the main focus of this religion is healing. The Lowa communicate with humans through dreams, possession, and divination, which is the practice of summoning a spirit back from the dead to speak with it. In return, voodooists will give offerings and sacrifice animals to the Lowa. Anyways, tarot cards are used to gain insight into the past, present, or future. James was working as a tarot card reader and also claimed to be a voodoo priest. It's difficult to know what exactly he believed in, if he incorporated black magic into his voodoo, and to what extent he practiced witchcraft, what the nature of it all was. There is a strong tradition of Haitian voodoo that is rooted in culture, family, and healing. From what I've read, practitioners seem frustrated with the misconception that they are worshipping the devil. But James was a loner. He wasn't tied to anyone. He was a drifter. He did his own thing, so it's totally plausible that he combined different beliefs together because he wanted to, because that's what he was interested in. He identified with the African roots of voodoo, but was into dark stuff like black magic. In 1978, James committed a robbery. Unfortunately, there are a lot of plot holes in this story. I've tried my best to fill in his timeline, but we're now jumping to 1978. James is now 26, and he finds himself in a Florida state courtroom. James was being tried for robbery and was found not guilty by reason of insanity. His mother, Alexine, would later tell that while he was in prison, James suffered a stroke, which impaired his mental abilities. Three years later, in 1981, James tried to commit suicide. He was placed under psychiatric care. James was going through a hard time. He clearly had some mental issues, behavioral problems, emotional regulation problems. He tried to kill himself. Eventually, he left NOLA, tarot card reading, and voodoo behind, and moved to Houston, Texas, to work as a cab driver. And this move leads to the crime that puts him on death row. March 7th, 1983, in the afternoon, James entered the offices of the Union Life Insurance Company, armed and with a mask on. According to the court documents Smith v. State, James was charged with killing Larry Don Rojas, the district manager for Union Life Insurance Company, during the robbery of the company's offices. Deborah Renee Wilson, the only eyewitness to the offense, testified that she and Rojas were alone in the outer office of the company at approximately 1 p.m. As she was counting money in the cash drawer, she heard the sliding glass window being pulled open. Looking up, she saw a man standing outside the window wearing a stocking mask over his head. The man who was pointing a gun at her cocked the gun and told her to give him all the money. Wilson related that she instantly panicked and ran behind the filing cabinet. Rojas, who was sitting at the secretary's desk, turned to Wilson and told her to give him the money. When Wilson did not move from behind the filing cabinet, Rojas got up and went to the cash drawer. He removed some money and holding it in his hand, went back towards the window. The gunman told him to put it into a container, so Rojas emptied a small trash can that was lined with a plastic bag and put the money inside. He then placed the can on a table near the gunman and began walking towards Wilson. Before he could reach the filing cabinet, however, the gunman instructed Rojas to return to the window. Rojas turned around and began pleading with the gunman not to shoot. The gunman then said something to Rojas, which Wilson was unable to hear. As Rojas began fumbling with his wrist as if to take off his diamond identification bracelet, a gunshot rang out. Rojas began running back towards Wilson, and the gunman fired a second shot. 
After the second shot, Rojas fell to the floor, mortally wounded. Medical testimony showed that Rojas died of one gunshot wound to the upper left side of the chest. Jose Montalov, a supervisor with Union National Life Insurance Company, testified that he was in his office when he heard the gunshots and screams coming from the cashier's office. Montalov related that he came out of his office just in time to see James, who was holding a gun, back away from the sliding glass window. Montalov followed James out of the office and downstairs. There he was joined in the pursuit by a businessman named Robert Lawson. Montalov and Lawson pursued James outside across a vacant lot and into an apartment complex. A group of workmen working on the apartment complex also joined in the pursuit and James was apprehended and disarmed near the complex. Montalov testified that while he was chasing James through the apartment complex, he saw James turn around at one point and aim his gun at him. Montalov testified that he ducked behind a corner of the building. Then he heard gunfire. When he looked around the corner, he saw that Javier Ramos and the rest of the workermen had James down on the ground and were struggling with him. Lawson, the businessman who joined in on the chase, testified that he saw James turn around and aim his gun at both him and Montalov while they were chasing James across the vacant lot. Javier Ramos, the foreman of the crew working on the apartment complex, testified that he and his men joined in the pursuit after Montalov called for help. One of his men, Rafael Gutierrez, was the first one to catch up with with James. When Gutierrez grabbed James, James aimed his gun at Gutierrez's chest. Ramos testified that he heard the gun click twice. James then turned and pointed his gun at Ramos. Ramos related that he told Gutierrez to knock James down. Gutierrez came up behind James and grabbed him and then the three men began struggling. During this time, James was trying to knock Gutierrez down with the gun. Ramos grabbed the gun to keep James from hitting Gutierrez with it. During the struggle, James pulled the trigger of the gun again, and this time the gun fired, with the bullet passing between Ramos's legs. Lucky fucking break. When James attempted to pull the trigger again, Ramos put his hand in the way of the hammer, so that when James pulled the trigger, the hammer hit the web of the skin between Ramos's thumb and forefinger. James was eventually wrestled to the ground and released his grip on the gun only after Ramos bit him on the hand. During the guilty, innocent phase of his trial on February 3rd, 1984, James attempted to escape. He jumped up from his chair at the council table and ran from the courtroom, just booked it. Deputy Sheriff J. L. Byford and an assistant district attorney pursued James down one flight of stairs and out of the annex court building. The two men pursued James for approximately four blocks before they lost sight of him. <sighs> Meanwhile, two Houston bondsmen were driving down the busy city street when they spotted Deputy Byford pursuing James. They lost sight of James for a while, but spotted him shortly thereafter exiting from the passenger's side of a van which was stopped at a red light. One of the bondsmen gave chase. A Houston police officer who was directing traffic nearby also joined in and eventually tackled and apprehended James. Marilyn Grigsby, the driver of the van, testified that she was stopped at a red light when James ran in front of her van and around to the passenger side and got in. He asked her to give him a ride. Grigsby testified that she was frightened and after going one block in the stop and go traffic, she asked James to get out of the car, and he did. Subsequently, Grigsby saw James apprehended by the Houston police officer. James is difficult. He is not an easy prisoner. On January 17th, 1984, a deputy sheriff went to the basement holdover cell to escort James to the third floor of the Harris County Courts building. James refused to allow him to handcuff his hands behind his back. After the deputy sheriff forcibly handcuffed James, he asked James what he was charged with and what his name was. James replied that he was charged with capital murder. Then James remarked, I kill people like you. James repeated this remark as they were riding up the elevator. And when they reached the third floor of the building, the deputy sheriff informed his supervisor of James's conduct and his threats. James was then told that an incident report would be filed against him. 
And James's response was, fuck you. Moving on to James's next stunt, the following month. While James was serving time, he tried to kill himself. He was pretty much over death row. He's like, you sentenced me to die, just do it already. What's the big deal? In 1985, the Texas court determined that James was not competent to handle his appeal, so they appointed an attorney to prosecute his appeal for him. Apparently, it came out that James had suffered several head injuries from car accidents and also bad falls. He also had a history of alcohol and drug abuse, symptoms of neurological damage, and suicidal tendencies. Alexi and his mother retained a clinical psychologist and associate professor at Florida State University. The psychologist has formed a conclusion on the basis of existing evidence. I have formed a professional opinion with a reasonable degree of medical certainty concerning James Edward Smith's current mental state. My opinion is that Mr. Smith has a history of schizophrenia that appears to be paranoid in nature marked by suicidal tendencies and religious delusions. There is also the possibility of organic brain damage indicated by Mr. Smith's history of head injuries, drug and alcohol abuse, and symptoms of neurological damage. At this time, based on Mr. Smith's condition, it is my opinion that he is mentally ill. This illness prevents Mr. Smith from understanding his actual legal position and the options available to him, and that this illness prevents Mr. Smith from making a rational choice among his options. James, on the other hand, had previously insisted that he was ready to die. He wanted to leave the material world and return to the spiritual world. He repeatedly claimed he was innocent, but he didn't want to spend his life on death row. So instead of fighting it, he was like, just fucking kill me already. He resisted all attempts for legal help because he saw no hope in his execution being overturned. He simply fought for his right to die. That's quite a fucking statement. Most of these efforts were on the part of James's mother, Alexine. She had her own doctors looking into this and she was fighting for her son. In 1988, there was a state evaluation of James. The state evaluation came about because of James's mother. She was continuously appealing his case, alleging that he was incompetent. The state evaluation took place about a month before James was set to be executed. On April 14th, 1988, 88, doctors Blevins and Morgan, psychologists at the Texas Department of Corrections, indicated that although James might have suicidal tendencies, he was competent. His execution, which was about a month away, should continue as scheduled. James's mom is not happy about this. James, on the other hand, is very happy about this. His execution is set for Tuesday, May 10th. The morning of his execution is when James requests Precunda dirt. And now I'm gonna try it. Uh, okay. It's very um, earthy. minerals. Oh. It's not that bad actually. Really not as bad as I thought. It has like a, a taste of dirt. Kind of growing on me. Hmm. Okay. Apparently, I like dirt. <laughs> so, James actually didn't eat the dirt. He's totally missing out. James actually had no intention of eating the dirt. It's one of the biggest misconceptions about his story. What he wanted the Rekunda dirt for was to create markings all over his body with it for a voodoo ritual that would ensure that his spirit would move on and not become a ghost. Prison officials did not honor his request. 
David Nono, a prison spokesman, said, It's not food. It's not sanitary. He'll be offered something off a regular prison menu. His request for Ray Kunda dirt is literally what he has become known for. It brought in soil experts from Texas A&M University. They wanted to figure out what Rayakunda dirt was. They had one of their spokeswomen, Mary Jo Powell, say that it was not identifiable soil, but was believed to be eaten in voodoo rituals. Thanks, Mary. Good detective work right there. I'm blown away by your findings. Instead, James was offered chicken for lunch, which he refused. He spent half an hour in the prison recreation yard, then he took a shower, and rested in the bunk of his cell. There was actually this couple, Steve and Lisa Haberman, who directed the Justice of Mercy project in Houston. They had shown up to protest James's execution. James was not happy about this. James actually told interviewers at the LS1 unit near Huntsville that if... <laughs> that if the Habermans interfered with his case, he would kill them. If I ever get my hands on them, I'll choke them and then they'll have a real murder case. I'm going to tear them and their organization to shreds because they're interfering with my decision. Let me get my execution over with and leave me alone. He also made sure to say again that he wanted to die and did not support the appeals made on behalf of him by his mother. So despite James's clear wishes that he wanted to die that day, the court granted him a stay of execution at 6.40 p.m. This was less than six hours before he was supposed to be executed. All thanks to his mother, Alexine Hamilton, who won a reprieve from the U.S. Supreme Court. Alexine said, I'm praising God right now. That's all I can say. I just thank God. She claimed that despite what the two doctors earlier said, that her son was not competent enough to waive his appeal. He had suicidal tendencies and all the other things that I've mentioned. He wants to die. It's not right. Alexine Hamilton of Indianapolis also contended that mitigating evidence in James's case was not allowed to be considered by jurors who sentenced James to death. Part of what Alexine presented in her appeal to the Supreme Court was that in 1973, James was found not guilty by reason of insanity in a Florida robbery trial. He was ordered by the court to receive treatment at Jackson Memorial Hospital outpatient clinic in Miami. The affidavit she submitted also said that James suffered a stroke while he was in prison and that it impaired his mental abilities. In response to Alexine, the Assistant Attorney General Bob Waltz, who was was not happy about this, said, James actually suffered from Bell's palsy, a treatable nerve inflammation that can lead to paralysis of one side of the face. Most patients recover from the paralysis. I don't see anything in here that makes a showing he's incompetent. They're trying to buy time. They're at this point merely saying he's incompetent to waive further appeals. From what we've seen of him, he's extremely competent to do so. Texas Department of Corrections spokesman Charles Brown said that when James found out he won an appeal, he was waiting in a holding cell next to the death chamber. James gritted his teeth and mumbled something inaudible upon hearing the news. He was later transferred back to his death row cell at prison's Ellis One unit. James was not happy. He didn't get his dirt and now they're not killing him. What the hell? Basically, James said he didn't want to end up like all the old timers on death row. He said that to all the anti-death penalty lawyers out there who wanted to help him to go elsewhere. I told them, you're wasting your time. Other people can use your help. Go talk to them. It's just so much sentimental and emotional nonsense. People were perplexed by James and couldn't understand why he wanted to die. But James cleared that up. He said, I don't understand all this clinging to life. Life is a temporary situation. The spirit moves on. Death is like eating a prune in the morning. <laughs> it's a natural function. I have no faith in the criminal justice system. It's foolhardy. I've spent enough time here. It's time to get out. I believe to stay here year after year is a waste. Nobody wants you to die. Isn't that a terrible thing? It's not a death wish. They gave me a sentence. I'm not a volunteer. You weigh the pros and cons. It's not craziness. It's determination. Other inmates say I'm crazy. The strangest person they've run into. But 
That's because they don't understand my rationale. All my life, I've been a loner. I'm very good at doing that. I have no forgiveness. I'm not sentimental. Let me get my execution over and leave me alone. Anyways, James wasn't the only person disappointed by the outcome of this. Raymond Rojas, Larry's brother, said, I'm very disappointed. He was caught red-handed. I don't know what else they can do besides go ahead and take care of their obligation to get rid of the guy. Hopefully the judge will reconsider. On top of all of that, James had more tricks up his sleeve. He was aware of his mother's appeal process, and when he was interviewed at the Ellis Unit 1, he told journalists that if his mother was successful in the appeal process and granting him a stay of execution, that he had tales of horror to share. The tales of horror that James told were that he participated in six ritual killings and that the corpse of a one-year-old infant was thrown off of a bridge after being beheaded as a sacrifice to a voodoo god. So the authorities in the areas where James claimed these rituals happened started looking into his claims. Two years go by. June 26th, 1990. Round number two for James. It's finally time. First of all, he was asked about the strange claims that he made a couple years prior. James said that he straight up lied. He did this for publicity because basically when he was originally sentenced and he was protesting that sentencing and claiming that he was innocent, he couldn't even get a paragraph written about him in a newspaper. But then he makes up these stories about killing babies in voodoo rituals and throwing their headless bodies off of a bridge and it's on the front page of newspapers all over the country. An unconventional and irreverent convict, James seems to delight in shocking news reporters. James said that death penalty foes are a fallacy, sham, hypocrisy, and that they have perpetrated a greater crime on inmates on death row. James described himself to journalists as very standoffish, brutal, and plain spoken. And when a reporter recently asked him if he was too smart for his own good, Smith replied, no, but I'm probably too smart for your good. A strong believer in the metaphysical, James scoffed at those who could not understand his philosophy or at least acknowledge his right to think differently. In an affidavit he filed in 1988 to try to explain why he wanted to die, James quoted the decision of a judge in a 1979 case in which a Nevada prisoner also was seeking to die. The quote is as follows, to deny him that freedom of choice would be to incarcerate his spirit, the one thing that remains free and which the state need not and should not imprison. His execution is on track. James said that he had called his mom on the phone and talked with her like a month prior and told her not to interfere. He said, I gave her a blast. I can't understand why in seeking to save my life, she sought to destroy it in such a way. James said that there would be consequences if his mother was successful in getting him a stay of execution again. He called his mother the do-gooder. He did not elaborate on what those consequences would be though. In an effort to crush any last minute appeals to get James declared incompetent, Harris County prosecutors brought him to Houston for a competency hearing. There, a psychiatrist re-examined him and found him competent to waive his appeals. He was then returned to Huntsville, where prison officials said he spent most of the day sleeping. Alexian is not concerned with that. Alexian doesn't care. She gets Roy Donnelly, her attorney based in Austin, Texas, to make a statement that uh, that Tuesday when psychiatrists had declared that James was competent enough to waive his appeals was based on a 15 minute jail cell interview and that the prison was so noisy it was difficult to even hear anything that Smith was saying. It's not gonna work this time though. His mom did try to appeal on behalf of him again. However, earlier that year, there was a ruling in an Arkansas case that there is no constitutional basis for petitions filed by third parties attempting to block another's execution. The prisoner in that case was named R. Gene Simmons. <laughs> Sorry. He also wanted to be executed. The court ruled that prisoners may volunteer to be put to death. So the Supreme Court refused Alexian's appeal. James said that he viewed death as an open door to someplace else. For me, the best avenue is not to prolong my involvement. He said that his mother's lawyers just 
don't think the way that he does, they don't get him, and that's why they think he's crazy. In regards to his mother blocking his execution two years prior, James said, Time is all I have. I could already be two years old in another body. A two-year-old prodigy. Everyone's going to die. I don't have faith in this system. That's why I'm not pursuing it. Apparently, other prisoners were betting on if he would back out or not, and instead of waiving all of his appeals, he would pursue an appeal. Prison officials said that James ordered yogurt for his last meal. Of course, his ordering of Ryukuna dirt was brought up, and James had to explain again that he had meant to sprinkle the dirt on his body to keep evil spirits from trapping his soul in Huntsville. He's like, I wasn't gonna eat it, you idiots. And the prison guards are like, well, it's still not on the menu. So Larry Rojas's widow, Deborah Rago of Charlotte, North Carolina, said, She's ready to put the nightmare behind her. I knew today was coming. You prepare yourself as best you can, but it is a time of stirring up old memories. The memories won't be put away until it's over. Killing him won't solve everything, but he gave up his right to live when he pulled the trigger. Deborah has since remarried, but she said that if she could talk to James, she would ask him why he killed her husband. She said, it's obvious it was not just for the robbery. He had his money, and he probably could have just turned and ran away and never been caught. She also admitted that she was bitter towards James and the people who were involved in getting him a stay of execution. She said that if the attorneys ever stood in her shoes, that they would think differently. He had no right to come in and do what he did and change my life forever. My son was one year old and he robbed him of the chance to ever know his dad. James Edward Smith was executed on the morning of June 26th, 1990. In his final statement, James said, I myself did not kill anyone, but I go to my death without begging for my life. I will not humiliate humiliate myself. I will let no man break me. When the general populace wakes up to the realities of execution, they will realize that the price to pay is a dear one. Smith labeled death penalty foes as vultures waiting until the last minute to peck around the body. He also said that they had wasted his time by getting him a state of execution two years prior. Then he smiled, winked, and said, Harry Krishna. James would be the third prisoner to be executed in Texas in 1990 and to the 36th inmate to be executed in Texas since executions had resumed in 1983. James was pronounced dead at 12.31 a.m., about 12 minutes after he began receiving a lethal injection. Even though James is dead, many people feel that his ghost remains. Before he died, he warned prison officials that his ghost would haunt over Huntsville for another 300 years. Maybe they should have given him the rakunda dirt that he asked for. That's a little And that is the story of James Edward Smith. Thank you all so much for watching. My name is Victoria Evans. Be safe out there and have, have a wonderful, wonderful Halloween. Halloween.